Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. Father, we've come together today. We're studying this important passage in the New Testament on the Lord's Supper. We do ask that you would guide us and teach us. Uh, we pray that we would, uh, as a result of this, uh, be better worshipers and uh, see the importance of uh, gathering together to remember the Lord Jesus on a regular basis. Guide us now and do teach us in our time together today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, we were looking at the, uh, at, the, at the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul begins in the second half of his chapter talking about the eighth problem that he wants to deal with at, at Corinth and that is the teaching on the Lord's Supper. And he says that uh, when you come together, uh, you do not come together for the better, but for the worse. And we saw last class that there were, uh, there were three things that were taking place at the Lord's Supper. There were divisions among them. Divisions between the haves and the have-nots. This is not the divisions of chapter 3. This is the divisions of those who would come on this occasion, when they would have a, a, a meal together and they would bring their own food and there were some that were, were, were feasting because they brought the food and then they were not sharing it with others that did not have. So that was one problem. Secondly, some of them were overindulging. They were getting drunk. They were treating it just as a, a banquet and overindulging. And then we saw thirdly that he mentions that uh, he says in verse 29 that some of you are doing this partaking. You are not discerning the Lord's body. You are not really seeing the sp spiritual significance of what, what you are doing. And so when you come together, it is not for the better. It is, is for the worse which is a, a very important statement, it is possible uh, to come together for the worse. And for some people, it really would be better if they did not go to church rather than go to church the way they are going. When, first of all, the, the purpose of the, of the meeting is lost sight of, Paul says, it would be better if you, if you did not come. When the Lord is lost sight of, it would be better if you did not come. If your focus is having a good time and not focusing on the Lord, then it would be better for you not to come. If other Christians are wronged because of your coming to church, it would be better for you not to come. Remember in chapter uh, 10 and verse 17, the one loaf signifies the unity of the body. And so this ordinance that was meant to symbolize unity became a means of division. Sadly, that is not only true at Corinth, it is also true today. When I was young, they said in the 1950s that the, uh, that the 11th, 11 o'clock hour on Sunday morning was the most segre segregated hour in the week. And what you had there was a, a strong division in the church because of the denial of the unity that we have in the body of Christ. There were many white churches where, where blacks were not, were not accepted. Now, that has changed a lot today, but we still have a divided church 
it's, it's, it's very different areas, though. Uh, our churches are divided uh, according to music. Uh, you have different kinds of music styles. You have uh, singles churches. You have young married churches. You have middle-aged family churches. You have old folks churches. You have traditional services and contemporary services. And uh, the church divides up in all of these kinds of things. Now, if our churches are just social clubs, then it would be better for us to just shut our doors and stop meeting. Paul says, you come together, together not for the better, but for the worse. Uh, and then he says, you'll notice in verse, uh, in verse 19, for there must also be factions among you in order that those who are approved may become evident among you. So, you notice he says here that the, that the problems that at, at Corinth, particularly the, uh, this matter of, of, of uh, factions and disorders at the Lord's Supper, really gives an opportunity for those who are approved by God to stand up and be counted. And so, what verse 19 is saying that, that uh, even when you have a disorder in the church like we have at Corinth, God uses, God uses these wrong things for his good end. This is Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who are called of God. God is able to take bad things and, and, and turn them around. And one of the things that you have here is that when you have situations like that, those who are godly, mature, spiritual Christians have a, uh, a, an opportunity to, uh, to stand up and be manifested. So um, we have the disorders here in verse, uh, in verse 22. Uh, we have the corrective. He says in verse 22, What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. Paul says, uh, If this is what's going to happen, because you have a a, uh, a communal meal, eat at home. Eat at home. And then in verses 23 to 26, he says, this is really what is important as far as the Lord's Supper is concerned. And these are the verses that we often read uh, at the Lord's Supper. For I delivered a, uh, unto you from the Lord that which I also received, and so on. The essence, the essence of the Lord's Supper in these verses, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What's the essence of the ordinance, the Lord's Supper? What's the essence of it? He says, taking the bread and taking the cup in remembrance of him. The essence, the important thing, is not the, the supper, the meal, but remembering the Lord through the bread and the wine is. Now, it's because of what Paul says here 
that we do not celebrate the Lord's Supper the way the early church did, with a full, the full meal. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with having the Lord's Supper uh, with an acu uh, a communal meal, an agape feast. Uh, we have done that in our church on occasions. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it, but that is not what is required. What is required is to break bread, take the cup in remembrance of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want to look at verses 23 to 26, or 23, and actually the rest of the chapter, because we really have some very important teaching in these verses on the significance of the Lord's Supper. What is the Lord's Supper? Well, first of all, <clears throat> the Lord's Supper is uh, an ordinance that was instituted by the Lord Jesus. You know what I mean by an ordinance? There are two ordinances of the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And uh, there are three things that are required for an ordinance of the church. Uh, the, the two ordinances that we have were established by Christ. That's the first thing. They were uh, practiced by the church and they are taught in the epistles. Established by Christ, uh, practiced by the church, and taught in the epistles. There are only two ordinances that fit those requirements, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism was commanded by Christ in the Great Commission. It was practiced by the church, starting in Acts 2 at the day of Pentecost. And it is taught about in the, explained in the epistles. Same way with the Lord's Supper. Commanded by Christ, practiced by the church. Uh, uh, why did the church observe the Lord's Supper? Christ told us to. And so in Acts 2.42, they met together for the uh, apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. You have those four things which are, which are mentioned there, one of which was the breaking of bread. Uh, in Acts 20 and verse 7, it says that the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. And so the reason that they came together was to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, the primary reason was not to teach or to pray or for fellowship. It wasn't even to hear the Apostle Paul. He was a great preacher. But it says they gathered to break bread. And so it was practiced by the church. It was explained in the epistles. And that's what we have here in 1 Corinthians Chapter 11. So, it is one of the two ordinances of the church. It was instituted by Christ. Verse 23 says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Now, when Paul says, I received this from the Lord, I think some people have have misinterpreted what he is saying, and they have thought that he was saying that he got a direct revelation of this from the Lord. Uh, the word received and the word delivered were common words. They were technical terms used in Judaism for uh, receiving uh, teaching and passing it on. Uh, it was used for... Uh, um, taking the, the authorized traditions of the church. Remember, we talked about tradition, uh, the traditions of the apostles, the authorized teaching of the church, and receiving them and passing them on. So when he says, we have received this from the Lord, 
And it could mean that the Lord gave this teaching to the apostles. Paul received it from the Lord, ultimately, through the means of the apostles. Do you think Paul, whenever he was with the apostles, asked them about what the Lord did or said? I think so. And so he says, uh, uh, what, his teach, what he is teaching now about the Lord's Supper ultimately goes back to Christ. So when he says, I received from the Lord, this is something that was instituted by Christ in the upper room on the night before the crucifixion, the night in which he was betrayed. Now, what is your attitude toward the Lord's Supper? Do you put an emphasis on it? Do you look at the Lord's Supper as something which is really important? Um, why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper? Yes. Remember what Christ did? Yeah. And, but why do we do it this way? To remember what Christ did? Why do we do it this way? Very simple. He told us to, didn't he? This do in remembrance of me. Uh, why do we break bread? This do in remembrance of me. Why do we take the cup? This do in remembrance of me, verses 24 and 25. So uh, Christ told us to. I find it very strange that, that uh, when Christ told us to do something like this, so many Christians put such little emphasis on it. Uh, we know it is something that pleases him, John, the Lord said in John 4, the Lord is seeking such to worship him. We know that it is his will. He has commanded us. Um, how often are we to do it? There, there are, are uh, a couple of things to notice. When he said in verses 24 and 25, this do or do this, he uses the present tense imperative. Now when you have a command, present tense in Greek doesn't have anything to do with time. It has to do with uh, a, a repeated kind of action. It is to be a habitual kind of action, a characteristic kind of thing. So we're to do this repeatedly. Uh, not only does it say to do this, meaning do it repeatedly, but Remember the Acts 20 and verse 10, 7 passage? It says that um, on the first day of the week, when, they were, when we were gathered together to break bread. That looks like it is saying that the church gathered on Sunday, it gathered on the first day of the week, and the purpose of their gathering together was to break bread. That was the purpose of their gathering. And did you notice what Paul says in verse 20 here? He says, therefore, because of the disorders, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. <laughs> you notice that's a criticism. He is saying that when you get together, it should be to partake of the of the Lord's Supper. Now, we, we cannot conclusively prove that in the early church they celebrated the Lord's Supper every Sunday. But that surely is the implication of what we have and what we have here and what we see in these, in these texts. It was the purpose of their gathering. Uh, the Corinthians should have been gathering to partake of the Lord's Supper, and they weren't. I think what has happened in the, in the 
in the Protestant church since the time of the Reformation. At the time of the Reformation, because they, there, there had been such a turning away from the Word of God, there was a turning back to the Word of God, and there, became a, there came to be a strong emphasis on preaching. There was a, 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 a shift from the emphasis on worship to the emphasis on, on preaching. And so instead of the center of the meaning being the table of the Lord for the Lord's Supper, it became the pulpit. And, uh, and so uh, because the preaching of Scripture had been neglected, you have that, that shift. Calvin wanted to observe the Lord's Supper weekly. But in the churches where he was, uh, was associated and influential, he was not able to win the day. And so if you look at many churches today, they will have the Lord's Supper once a month. Some churches have the Lord's Supper once a quarter. That's once every three months. And some churches have the Lord's Supper biannually, twice a, a year. And so if you look at, at, what, at, at the worship service of, of churches today, many evangelical churches, what is it? It's a preaching service, isn't it? Uh, it's called a worship service, but it is really a, a preaching service. If you ask, where's the worship? You'll get, well, we worship in... In our, in our singing. <laughs> and that is, uh, that is the center and focus of the worship. In the New Testament, the center and focus of worship was at the Lord's Supper. And uh, it, would, it, would, it would seem very strongly that that, that, that worship at the Lord's Supper was, was practiced weekly. And I think that uh, there should be much more emphasis on worship and much more emphasis on the Lord's Supper uh, today than we have in, in, many, in many churches. So, uh, the the importance of the, the Lord's Supper. Now, I want to look specifically at the meaning of the Lord's Supper, and that will get into the answer of your, your question as to what this means. He says in verse 23 that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, verse 24, that word, Thanks in, uh, in Greek is the word eucharisteo, eucharisteo. And uh, that is why some churches refer to the Lord's Supper as the Eucharist. Some call it the Eucharist, some call it communion, some call it the breaking of bread, some refer to the Lord's Supper. These are all different names, but the word Eucharist comes from that word to give thanks, because that's what we, we do at the Lord's Supper. We give thanks. Uh, he says that the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he give, had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He says the same thing with the, with the cup. The bread and the wine are symbols. Now, unfortunately in the history of the church, there has been an awful lot of controversy over these words. The bread, this is my body which is for you. The cup, uh, this cup is the new covenant in my, in my blood. Um, there are, are four general different 
interpretations of these words. When Christ said, this is my body, uh, the Roman Catholic Church takes those words very literally. That the priest uh, has the power by the words that he utters when he takes the bread and lifts it up, uh, that that bread, that wine becomes the literal body and blood of Christ. Uh, the name for that doctrine is called transubstantiation. So the Roman Catholic Church teaches the doctrine of transubstantiation, which means that the, that the bread is and wine is actually changed into the literal body and blood of Christ. It still looks like bread. It still feels like bread. It still tastes like bread. It has the properties of bread, but it is, is actually the literal body and blood of Christ. Not only do they say that the, the, uh, that the uh, bread and the, and the wine become the body, the actual body and blood of Christ, but they also say that the Lord's Supper is a sacrifice, that it is actually a propitiatory sacrifice. It is a sacrifice of atonement. And so Christ is re-sacrificed over and over again in the Lord's Supper, which seems to me to be actually contrary to the whole book of Hebrews that says that, that Christ offered up one sacrifice. And instead of the many sacrifices of the Old Testament, his one sacrifice is sufficient forever to take away our sins. Yes? No, they, they, they do look at his death on the cross as, as an effective atonement for sin, but there is a re-sacrifice uh, in, the, in, the, in the mass, as they would call it. Um, you've heard of uh, the Feast of Corpus Christi. Uh, corpus is the word for body, and uh, Christi is the... Uh, genitive of Christ. So the Corpus Christi is the body of Christ. And they will, they will take the, the, uh, the host, the bread that has been transformed into the body of Christ, and they will have a, a procession, and people will actually worship. They will bow down and worship the, uh, the body of Christ, which is being carried in procession in the, in the festival. There is a second viewpoint, uh, which is the Lutheran doctrine. And Luther also takes these words of Christ literally. Now, he does not say that the bread and the wine are changed. That's what the Roman Catholics do. He does not say that the bread and the wine are changed. But he does say that at the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of Christ are literally present. And he will use uh, prepositions, he would use prepositions like in, with, and under. In, with, and under the bread and wine. You have the literal body and blood of Christ. So with the Lutherans, uh, you do literally eat the body of Christ and you literally do drink his blood. The name for this, this doctrine is called consubstantiation. Consubstantiation. Trans means that there is a transformation of the body and blood Con means that along with the literal bread and wine are the literal body and blood of, of Christ. The third 
interpretation is the memorial view. The reformer that was, uh, was especially associated with that was uh, Zwingli. Uh, Zwingli was the, the Swiss reformer. And Zwingli argued that what we have here is bread, are bread and wine used as symbols, and that's what they are. They are not the literal body and blood of Christ. They are symbols of the body and blood of Christ. And Zwingli pointed out that, first of all, you know, Christ said, look at this bread. This is my body. His literal body was actually there. His literal hand was holding, was holding the bread when he, when he said that. And then when he says, uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, well, the Roman Catholics and, and Lutherans do not take that statement literally, do they? The, the, the um, cup is literally the new covenant? No, the cup is not the covenant. The contents of the cup, represent the blood of Christ. And the blood is not the new covenant itself. The blood that was shed is the basis for the new covenant. So you have the, the Lord's body separate from the bread. You have the, the cup, which symbolizes the new covenant that was based upon the shed blood of Christ. Thirdly, this, this Christ often used figurative expressions like this. When he said, I am the vine, do you take that literally? When he said, uh, I am the door, I am the light of the world. These are all figurative expressions. That's the way we speak. That's what, isn't it? If I, uh, if, I, if I pull out my wallet, I don't know what I've got here uh, in my wallet. I've got a, oh, this is a picture you can hardly see. But if I say, look, that is my family. Now, wait a minute. That's my family? That's not my literal family, is it? <laughs> that picture, that picture uh, represents my family. That's just a piece of paper with colors and shapes on it, right? That's the way we talk. That's the way we talk. And when Christ says, this is my body, he means this is a symbol of my body. This represents my body. And uh, this is my blood. This represents my blood. And so he has given us symbols, symbols that remind us of Christ in a very particular way. That's why he says, take this bread, take this, this cup, do this in remembrance of me. These symbols are meant to remind us of Christ, to bring him consciously to our mind. And when it speaks of his body, he, the eternal son of God, assumed a human body, took upon himself human nature. He assumed a body in his incarnation. And it was by means of that body that he died on the cross. And particularly, scripture says that in his dying on the cross, in his human nature, in his human body. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, or chapter 2, verse 24. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. So we look at the body of Christ, and that was the, 
body and human nature that he took upon himself in the incarnation. It was the body through which he died on the cross. It was through that death on the cross that he bore our, our sins. Do this and remember, and remember these things about me. And it says that he took the, uh, that the blood, uh, this is my, this is the, uh, this, this cup is the new covenant in my, in my blood. Uh, his blood looks at, uh, or the wine looks at his blood that was shed as the ransom price for our, our sin. Um, in whom, Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Peter says, you have been redeemed, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, you have been redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. So he shed his blood as the basis for our forgiveness. Uh, his blood is the foundation of the new covenant, which is, which is grounded on the forgiveness of sins in Jeremiah 31, 34. So do this in remembrance of me. Uh, I think that this shows us what the primary significance of the Lord's Supper is. It is a remembrance meeting. It is a memorial meeting. It shows us what we do at the Lord's, what we do at the Lord's Supper. Besides eating the bread and, and drinking that, what do we do? We remember him. What do we think about? He says, remember me. And when we think about Christ, we can remember, we can remember many things about him, but the, the symbols point us to the fact that we are to remember him in a very specific, in a very specific way. Notice verse 26, because uh, as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death. You proclaim his death until he, he comes. So, the bread that is broken, the blood uh, that was shed, proclaim his death. And so, it's not primarily that we remember Christ as a teacher and all of the lessons that he taught. We remember Christ dying on the cross for our sins. Uh, and if we do that, what is our response? Worship. It has to be thanksgiving and worship. Now, the memorial view that I have just presented here was the, the view of, of Zwingli. There is a fourth view, there is a fourth view that was represented by John Calvin. And Calvin emphasized the spiritual presence of Christ at the supper. <clears throat> so, at the Lord's Supper, Christ is spiritually present, not literally as the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans would hold it, but Christ is spiritually present and we, and we feed upon him. Now, the way I've just said that, basically Z Zwingli would have agreed to that. And, and anybody who holds the memorial view would agree to that. Calvin was trying to say more. He was trying to say that there was a special spiritual presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper that is not there on other occasions. 
and uh, trying to define what that spiritual presence is becomes very, becomes very difficult. Now, when, when we, what do we do? He says, uh, he, he, they broke it, uh, he distributed it to them, and they ate. Eat this bread and drink this cup. Not only are the bread and the, and, and the, and the wine symbols, but the very act of eating the bread and drinking the wine is a symbolical action. It is an, uh, a, a symbol of our faith in Christ. It is a symbol that we are, we are, are taking Christ and uh, uh, we are, are feeding upon Him. You have, uh, you have in John 6, Christ says, I am the, the bread of life. Uh, this is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, in John 6, the Lord is not talking primarily about the Lord's Supper. He is using figurative language and so that he is saying that he is the bread of life. If we take this bread, if we eat it, uh, and that eating of the bread is a symbol of our faith in Christ. And we appropriate Christ by faith, just as we, as, as we take our nourishment from bread by eating it. And so, uh, I think that while, while John 6 is not primarily about the Lord's Supper, it does have an application to us. What do we do at the Lord's Supper? We, at the Lord's Supper, go back again and again to the faith that we first exercised when we received Christ as our, our Savior. We say again and again, Lord Jesus, you are my Savior, my Faith and my trust is, is, is in you. And we're not getting saved all over again, but we are affirming, reaffirming every time we do that. The fact that I am trusting in you. I am trusting in your death on the cross for me. I am trusting in your shed blood for the forgiveness of my sins. And so every time we do that, we are in a sense feeding on Christ, and our faith is, is strengthened. Now, here is where I, 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 I cannot understand Calvin's view of the spiritual presence of Christ. Um, he says that Christ is present spiritually in the, at the Lord's Supper in a, in a unique way. Now, Christ said that he is always with us. Remember the Great Commission? Behold, I am with you always. Now, if I am having my devotions in my room by myself, is Christ present with me? Am I feeding upon him? and worshiping Him? Uh, how is the Lord's Supper different as far as the presence of Christ? And that's where I find, find the, uh, the discussion uh, among the Reformed view, the, those who hold to the Reform, where I find it fuzzy. Um, uh, it's not clearly defined. And that is why I hold to the memorial view. Burkhoff, in his, in his theology, said that uh, Zwingli wanted to exclude from the doctrine of the Lord's Supper all unintelligible mysticism. And so you can say that 
there is a spiritual presence, but that becomes very fuzzy, becomes very mystical, and is not clearly defined. What we do have is, uh, is you know, the New Testament does tell me to worship privately, to feed upon Christ, uh, to be occupied with Him, to fellowship with Him. It tells me to do that privately, and it tells me to do that publicly. It tells me to pray privately. And when I say publicly, I mean corporately, in the church. It tells me to pray privately, and to pray corporately in the church. And so, uh, I would not look at this as, uh, as essentially different, but very, very important. And it is not something that is just to be done in private. It is to be done collectively, corporately. And when he says, do this, that verb is second person plural. You plural do this.